Hi, everyone. I think we got our panelists, uh, our last panelist on, so I think we're going to start getting going. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this webinar on One Health Approaches for Health Disaster Risk Reduction. This webinar is sponsored by Future Earth, EcoHealth Alliance, and the International Association for Ecology and Health. We organized this webinar in recognition of the International Day for Disaster Risk Reduction held last Friday, as well as the upcoming International One Health Day on November 3rd. I think you will all agree that this topic is extremely timely in light of the increasing global attention to health security, including the wake of Ebola virus in West Africa, Zika virus last year, and with the current plague outbreak in Madagascar and the Seychelles. At the same time, there are severe health consequences from other types of disasters, such as landslides, earthquakes, hurricanes, and drought. Their wide-ranging health effects can span from infectious diseases, malnutrition, water insecurity, cancer, respiratory diseases, and more. These health emergencies remind us of the urgent need to develop multi-sectoral partnerships to address the underlying drivers of health threats and help prevent, detect, respond, and recover from disease events. We are honored to be joined by an incredible group of presenters today, Dr. Shadia Wanus from the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, Dr. Christina Romanelli from the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, Dr. William B. Karish from EcoHealth Alliance, and Dr. Timothy Bouley from the World Bank. For format, each presenter will speak for approximately 10 minutes, followed by questions and discussion. We ask that you kindly hold your questions until the end and submit them through the chat box. We will record uh, the webinar to allow for further dissemination of this important topic. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Shadi Wanus, who serves as the Senior Advisor um, Senior Advisor and Health Focal Point at the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction in Geneva. Shadia will give us background on the global framework for disaster risk reduction and the role of integrated approaches in addressing health disasters. Over to you, Shadia. Uh, thank you very much, Brian. Thank you for the invitation and for organizing this uh, webinar. Um, I'm honored to be here and to build on our uh, uh, working session that we held in the Global Platform for Disaster Risk Reduction last May in Cancun, Mexico where we presented uh, this work uh, uh, to a huge number of uh, uh, participants there from all sectors. Um, can I have the presentation uh, now started? I believe I, I just handed it over oh. to you. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so my presentation uh, will focus on, on the health uh, in uh, the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, which was adopted uh, by uh, UN member state in March 2015. The expected outcome of this framework is to uh, achieve substantial reduction of disaster uh, risk and losses in, in lives and livelihood and, and in all aspects uh, that concern uh, persons, businesses, communities, and countries. Um, I'm having trouble to move the, the slides. So uh, the features of the Sendai framework and how uh, this is different from the previous framework for disaster risk reduction. Uh, the first one, it's the approach in, in this uh, framework. It's more people-centered a preventive approach, not reactive, focusing on uh, preparedness and risk reduction. And it builds on the understanding that disaster risk reduction has to be multi-hazard, uh, multi-sectoral, and inclusive of all uh, of societies in order to be effective and efficient. In terms of risk, it covers all uh, kind of uh, uh, hazards, uh, including natural and man-made hazards and all related environmental, technological, and uh, most importantly for the session, biological hazards. It also covers uh, small scale, uh, large scale, frequent and infrequent, and whether it's uh, a sudden onset or low onset, uh, uh, slow onset of uh, disasters. So in, in this uh, 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 way, uh, uh, the Sendai framework is very comprehensive and, and very uh, forward looking and uh, people centered. Now, how, uh, uh, we are, sorry, uh, how we are trying to achieve uh, this uh, uh, expected outcome of uh, uh, the Sendai framework is by shifting the focus from managing the disaster to managing the risk. And to do this, we have to uh, uh, reduce existing risk 
but at the same time we have to work to prevent and avoid the creation of a new risk. And he, here comes the, the risk reduction uh, part of uh, the equation. And also we have to focus on preparedness and building the resilience uh, of the uh, society and the economy to withstand all type of disasters. And the ultimate goal is to uh, achieve the sustainable development of our communities and countries and to do this in uh, to be risk informed development and based on on the scientific and uh, and evidence uh, inputs uh, now the four uh, priorities of the sendai framework we have four priorities the first one is to understand disaster risk so we need the data we need the information in order to be able to uh, uh, reduce uh, 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 vulnerability exposures uh, and also understand the hazard that we are facing. Uh, um, the second priority is uh, concerning uh, strengthening the disaster risk governance. How this multi-sectoral uh, and all of society abroad should work uh, to, to manage the disaster risk. The third priority is about investment in, in uh, resilience uh, of uh, uh, infrastructure, but also in, in uh, the uh, communities and, and the people. And to do this, we, we need the public-private partnerships. And the last priority is to enhance the disaster preparedness, but also to focus on, on the recovery and building back better uh, uh, after uh, disasters. Now, the Sendai framework has also seven uh, global uh, targets. So we need to achieve by 2030, uh, but one of them we, we need to achieve it by 2020. I will ex explain this uh, now. Now, four of those global targets, uh, they are uh, directly re related to health. The first one is to reduce uh, the global disaster mortality, and then to reduce the number of affected people, and uh, to reduce the direct economic uh, uh, losses due to disasters, and to reduce the disaster damage to critical infrastructure and disruption of basic services. And uh, to, uh, at the same time, uh, increase the availability and access to multi-hazard early warning system and disaster risk information. These four global targets are directly related and linked to the health. Now, uh, the other two targets that we have to support countries to increase uh, and to have national uh, and local disaster risk reduction strategies by 2020. So this is the first target we, we need to achieve in, in three uh, years uh, period. And the last one is to uh, enhance the international cooperation uh, made to developing countries uh, to achieve the expected outcome and goal of this framework. Now, why health? Uh, it's uh, now embedded in, in this uh, framework, uh, unlike uh, the previous uh, frameworks that didn't have uh, enough focus on health. I think because of the, uh, at the time where member states and uh, partners were negotiating the, the framework, uh, we have witnessed uh, uh, an increasing frequency and intensity of health emergencies, including uh, Ebola uh, in West Africa. And we have experienced the, uh, the huge uh, human loss and economic loss because of those uh, disasters. And of course, at the same time, why we are uh, witnessing this increase in frequency and intensity because of the uh, risk drivers and increasing. And uh, I think Billy uh, will go in, into uh, more details about the risk driver of disease emergence at country level. And also to give just an example of one of the industry, the extractive industry, uh, the economic impact uh, from a health uh, emergency on this uh, uh, industry will be between 10 to 40 billion in potential liability over the next uh, 10 years. So recognizing all this, member states put a lot of uh, effort uh, to, uh, to ensure health is embedded in the Sendai framework. And in this, uh, we have uh, a lot of um, uh, text uh, about about health in the framework, but the main focus is on preparedness, building the resilience of the health system to withstand all kinds of hazards, integration of disaster risk management into the health sector at all level, and development of the capacity of uh, health workers uh, to understand and apply uh, risk uh, reduction uh, approach in their work. 
Now, um, we need to move from uh, uh, the normative uh, part uh, into the uh, implementation, how we can uh, translate uh, this into action. And for that, we uh, uh, organized an international conference uh, last year in Thailand uh, in cooperation with the government of Thailand and the uh, WHO to discuss exactly the implementation of this uh, health aspect of the Sendai framework and uh, uh, participants agreed on uh, seven uh, global uh, principles, they call it the Bangkok principles for the implementation. And it, it all focus on the integration, the cooperation between the health authority and the relevant stakeholders, the public-private uh, uh, investment uh, in uh, health facilities and infrastructure, And, and of course, uh, uh, into integration of disaster risk reduction into the health education and training and getting the health uh, risk information into the overall disaster risk information and the profiling and advocating for cross-sectoral transboundary cooperation. And importantly, to do all this work in coherence with what we are doing uh, for health in, uh, in the SDGs, in the climate change ag agenda, and in, in the uh, urban uh, agenda as well. Now, uh, I would like just to give you uh, one example of uh, uh, the implementation of these Bangkok principles uh, at the country level, where we have uh, this project, uh, pilot project in the Ebola affected countries, uh, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, implemented in collaboration with our partners, uh, WHO, UNDB, EcoHealth Alliance, and funded by uh, USAID and the Japanese government. So what did we do in this uh, project? Uh, we, we took the first two priorities of the Sendai framework on understanding risk and on risk governance, and we turned it into an activities at the national level uh, where uh, the health sector and the other relevant sector, the Ministry of uh, Educa uh, Environment, Agriculture, Finance and Development, and entities uh, working on climate change uh, adaptation, came together to uh, um, integrate health into, into this work, uh, into risk information and risk profiling, but also into risk governance, and uh, uh, developed a comprehensive plan of action uh, for, for doing this. Uh, the uh, follow-up on, on, on this project uh, is ongoing uh, to support countries implement the plans of actions. Now, uh, there are other activities uh, done by other countries, and I will give just a few examples of this. Uh, uh, Pakistan is developing now the national action plan for the implementation of the Bangkok principles. Thailand is uh, developing a proposal for an international training course on health and DRR where they will bring participants from developing countries uh, 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 to do the training course uh, in, in Thailand. And other countries uh, are doing um, uh, similar or uh, other activities as well. Now, agencies uh, and partners are doing uh, also uh, uh, a lot of work on, on this and I, I will give example from the uh, collaboration between the World Bank, the EcoHealth Alliance, uh, and the, the CBD to include disaster risk reduction perspective into the One Health operational framework, into the bio threat reduction uh, uh, organized by uh, OIE, and into the uh, human biodiversity linkages uh, uh, organized by the CBDs. Other agencies as well, UNDB and other partners are doing a lot of effort to move this agenda forward. And uh, we really look forward to continue this work with you and, and to uh, ensure that uh, it's uh, uh, systematically uh, uh, embedded into the work of the uh, countries uh, at all levels. Thank you so much. Over to you, Brian. Thank you so much, Dr. Winnows, for that really inspiring overview. And uh, I think it really highlighted the importance of multi-sectoral collaboration. So thank you so much. Um, we'll move on to our next speaker, Dr. Christina Romanelli, who serves as the Biodiversity and Health Lead at the Secretariat of the UN Convention on Biological Diversity in Montreal. 
Um, Christina, over to you. And, and Christina, we, we can advance your slides if that's easiest for you. But I think you may have to activate your audio. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Thank you very much, Catherine, and, and to all or it really is a pleasure. Uh, it's both an honor to have been invited and, and a pleasure to be amongst um, all of those who can participate here today. Um, so I, just to give a little brief background on on the biodiversity convention for those of us who for those who may be unfamiliar with with the convention, uh, it is one of the three Rio conventions. Uh, the other two being on climate change and desertification, which was derived directly from the 92 Earth Summit. So each of the three instruments uh, that arose from the summit, summit, including the Convention on Biological Diversity, re represents a way of, of contributing to the sustainable development of objectives of Agenda 21. Um, others that followed, including the Millennium Development Goals, the strategic plan for biodiversity 2011-2020 and of course most recently the sustainable development goals. So what's relevant to note is that the three real conventions are um, intrinsically linked and they operate within the same ecosystems and also address the same inter interdependent issues. Um, and it is worth uh, noting that uh, social outcomes, including health and e economic development, are intimately uh, interrelated with the health of their, our ecosystems. And they do share uh, multiple causal interdependencies and risks, of course, uh, but they also sh present shared opportunities. And I think that's what um, we large what I will largely focus on to attenuate, m mitigate, and minimize those risks. Um, and this is really at the heart of the three key messages that I'd like to um, discuss in the seminar, focus specifically on risk uh, in a first instance, but also resilience and uh, ways forward, including One Health ecosystem-based adaptation. Um, and ecosystem-based uh, adaptation and mitigation for disaster risk reduction. So in the first instance, it, it's worth reiterating that health risks can be precipitated by impacts on critical ecosystems or uh, the collapse of a host of ecosystem services that are essential to our health, including as sources of food, uh, nutrients, medicines, medicinal compounds, fuel, energy, etc. Um, and they also perform critical functions that range from the regulation of pests and disease um, that Dr. Koresh will be uh, discussing later to the regulation of climate change and natural disasters. So each of these functions has both direct and indirect direct consequences for the health and well-being in times of risk. And each of them is a really important component of the complex sort of um, epidemiological puzzle that confronts uh, our efforts to stem the tides of both infectious and non-communicable diseases. So, Sizes. I'm sure each of us on this call know that disasters, you know, include flooding, storms, extreme weather events, wildfires, as well as biological hazards and disease epidemics. But what not everyone bears in mind is that some of these outcomes can often, can in fact be precip precipitated or intensified by ecosystem disruption. Uh, while also increasing the frequency and intensity of some of the climate-related uh, extreme events and disasters. So with this in mind, a key consideration is that ecosystem degradation can increase the vulnerability of human populations to these disasters, 
while at the same time compounding the effects of other drivers, including climate change, um, which are not unrelated, even though they're often treated as a uh, as separate issue from uh, disaster risk reduction. But, but it is worth noting that impacts of the climate and disasters have to be addressed in tandem, should be addressed in tandem, since over 80% of these actually, um, they actually intersect. intersect. Um, for example, the number of reported weather-related natural disasters has more than tripled since the 60s, resulting in over 60,000 uh, deaths, each, mainly in developing countries. Uh, at the same time, rising sea levels and increasing uh, number of extreme weather events um, continue to destroy homes, medical facilities, other essential services. We've seen a surge of these, um, including throughout the U.S. Um, very recently. Um, a lack of safe wa water at the same time kills almost 600,000 children under the age of five every year. Heat waves, heat island effects in cities put the elderly and other people um, vulnerable groups at risk. So an important consideration is that biodiversity and ill health also share a number of the same drivers and that these are in turn often uh, exacerbated by climate change. So if we turn, for example, to what I believe is the next graph, hello, on the, on the next slide, yeah, right there. <clears throat> Um, as we see here, land use change, so for example, uh, deforestation for agricultural production or natural resource extraction, is perhaps the leading driver of disease emergence in, in humans uh, from wildlife. So changes to habitats, the alteration of species composition, uh, which is influenced by conditions that might more favorably support carriers of disease and or changes in abundance in a given altered habitat can also harbor new opportunities for trans disease transmission and these in turn have major implications for human health. Um, at the same time habitat change such as deforestation practice may not only lead to less resilient ecosystems but can also directly or alter the capacity of carbon sinks and thereby further increase risks and positive feedback loops from climate change. So that um, feeds into the next sort of the, the next um, key message that I wanted to address. So on the flip side of risk, we have resistance and resilience. So biodiversity and ecosystem conservation and restoration and sustainable use are integral to the resilience of ecosystems both and, and, and can strengthen them both by contributing to adaptation to climate change and moderating the impacts of disasters on human populations and natural environments. So disaster resilient societies are increasingly, and we'll get to this slide soon, but disaster resilient societies are increasingly linked to and dependent on um, the resilience of ecosystems and sustainability and security in the flow and delivery of essential ecosystem goods and services. So not only those that are directly associated with resilience to uh, immediate disaster impacts, but also those that normally support communities, including vulnerable populations and society at large. So there are a number of ways, and some of them are, are exemplified in this slide, but there are a number of ways in which in, intact and restored ecosystems can contribute to a, a resilience. Uh, for example, through the improvement of coastal protection, through wave attenuation, uh, the ability of floodplains and greening of river catchments to protect from river flooding events um, by diverting and holding excess water, 
of coastal ve vegetation um, is also an important carbon sink and itself can bury organic carbon 30 to 50 times faster than terrestrial forests. Um, globally burying a similar amount of organic uh, uh, carbon to terrestrial forests, even though the area of co coastal vegetation is only about 3% that of a forest. So they do play a really critical role. And so the notion of co-benefits that ecosystem-based adaptation and mitigation options provide um, are absolutely essential. And of course, they, <clears throat> they, um, they apply uh, infectious diseases, but as the slide here indicates, um, they're equally relevant to other areas and provide other um, co-benefits. So that is um, that is essential to strengthen uh, adaptation. So adaptation is um, strengthened by biodiversity and ecosystem based engineering. Um, and the example that we see here is, well, one of the examples that we can derive from, from this slide, for example, is, uh, is on nutrition sensitive adaptation strategies in the agriculture sector, which can play a very important role. Um, they're also critical to informing um, the development of and application of best practices. They can certainly contribute to food safety. They play, a, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> a critically important educational role. Um, integrated integrated farming systems that exploit the synergies of horticulture, aquaculture, and small livestock production, for example, can reduce waste and expenses on agricultural inputs while also increasing the diversity of food that is produced. Uh, adaptation strategies, such as mangrove repopulation, for example, as, as, as you see in, in this photo, can contribute to disaster risk reduction while also contributing to carbon sequestration. Um, at the same time, those mangroves are uh, constitute natural sources of micronutrients. Um, of agricultural extension services, for example, to better pro to promote better crop and food production, diversity and biodiversity, uh, and and biodiversity. So, the point made here is that they do offer a number of, of co-benefits. Um, to build the resilience of natural and managed la landscapes. Importantly, they're not. Um, they're not only. They're not only effective from from to to strengthen the natural resilience of 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 ecosystems, but they also constitute cost-effective strategies with benefits that go well beyond resilience, such as protecting marine food chains, supporting local fisheries, uh, small-scale agriculture and livelihoods, all of which are absolutely essential to long-term health and well-being. So, for example, coral reefs are extremely effective in protecting against coastal hazards. Um, they can reduce energy, wave energy by up to 97% and protect over 100 million people in this way from coastal storm surges. If we take another example, in Vietnam, for example, planting mangroves, mangroves for storm, storm surges can incur only one-seventh of the cost of creation and maintenance of, of seawalls or dikes. Um, and um, at the same time, it also preserves wetlands, it preserves the marine food chains, supports local fisheries. So I see that we've moved on to the next slide. I think I've already gone over my time. Um, so 
maybe a few final points is that in, in some cases the effectiveness of ecosystem-based adaptation measures can be considered lower than comparable engineered solutions. And nobody here is, is arguing that it needs to be one or the other. Both are needed. However, um, they also often constitute a low regret option because they provide other benefits that go well beyond resilience, including economic benefits, um, including to sustainable development, including to livelihoods. And the last slide sh that we see here also shows other opportunities offered by holistic approaches um, to jointly reduce the vulnerability to infectious diseases in this instance, which are exacerbated by global environmental changes. Um, some of those benefits are uh, directly indicated in this slide. And uh, Dr. Koresh will no doubt uh, discuss this further in some detail. So, Maybe one last consideration to bear in mind is that together with other health, uh, planetary health, um, ecosystem-based disaster risk reduction and ecosystem-based adaptation do offer critical opportunities that are closely aligned with the Bangkok principles that uh, Dr. Wanous was talking about um, to build back better and to offer whole of society solutions, making social and ecological systems more resilient and incorporating opportunities provided by nature and ecosystems to reduce disaster risk, in, such as uh, mangrove conservation initiatives. So maybe as a last point, it is not only coherent, but essential to the implementation of global commitments. Um, including those of the Biodiversity Convention, but as also other sustainable development uh, agreements, including the Paris Agreement and uh, Sustainable Development Goals and 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. So with that, I pass it to, I believe, Dr. Koresh. Thank you so much, Christina. For making the link to biodiversity and engaging the biodiversity community in health disaster risk reduction. Our third speaker is Dr. William B. Karish, Executive Vice President for Health and Policy at EcoHealth Alliance in New York. Hi, welcome everybody. It's an honor to be speaking with you. Uh, bonsoir, buenas tardes. I know we have people in from all over the world here today. So I'm going to jump right in and get into more of the details on the world of infectious diseases and emerging infectious diseases as they relate to our conversation today. Uh, the basic premise, of course, is the One Health concept that underlies this and this linkage between the health of animals and the health of the environment and the health of people and that overlap and the different approaches that people are, are taking to address these issues and they all fit nicely under this concept of disaster risk reduction. For a bit of background, we know that the majority of infectious diseases are shared with animals. So there's an obvious link right there. And I'll get into a little more about the environmental connections, but we can't ignore those because it's really the underlying basis for all of this. Um, in addition to these emerging infectious diseases, um, we just have the regular everyday chronic endemic zoonotic diseases and parasitic diseases that go between humans and animals. Very conservatively, uh, the estimates are about a billion human cases a year. Others have estimated up to 2 billion cases a year, which is 25% of the world's population. One of the reasons it's gaining more attention, of course, is the, because of the rising number. So these are real numbers. This is real data. It's not a, anybody's personal opinion, uh, but we see this general march towards an increasing number year after year and decade after decade. Most of these new ones, these emerging ones, are you can see in there in yellow and blue, are zoonotic from either wildlife or livestock. But this connection with the environment, particularly with wildlife, seems to be a trend and it seems to be growing more strongly. Some of the reasons it's capturing the world's attention is because of the cost. 
So as we can see, over the last few decades, there's this kind of trend to economic losses linked to these emerging infectious diseases. Now, the economic losses are not all about medical care. So on this slide, you'll see near the top, the medical cost or the public health sector costs, which traditionally are dealing with the final outcome of these disasters, is actually quite small as the impact on the general economics, either globally or nationally, have huge costs uh, related with these outbreaks, hence why the general, the, it's a general societal concern rather than just a, limited to a public health concern. If we look historically at where emerging disease events occurred, we get a map like this. But this is very biased, but based on people's ability to report, their interest in report, reporting, you'll see there's more of a focus in the developed parts of the world where there's more scientists, people are, tend to publish more. So if you review the published literature as we did back um, almost 10 years ago, you see this bias. But we have methods to remove that bias um, from the work and our ecological approach, if you look at the biological side, the ecological underpinnings, we can identify the characteristics associated with these outbreaks and then map those characteristics and we get a better view of the world as far as the risk. This particular one is new zoonotic EIDs. We can do others, we can do antimicrobial resistance, we can do vector-borne diseases, we can do diseases from livestock. The, the approach is the same and we've done that. This one just illustrates um, an example for zoonotic EIDs because of the uh, continued interest. So we all know uh, plague is coming out now in Madagascar, we had Ebola, all of those, and those are linked back to wildlife. The relative influence, if you look on that bottom left, you'll see what are the drivers uh, broken down to mathematically. So it's where large human populations exist, where population growth is occurring or change is occurring, and where there's mammal diversity as a proxy for biodiversity. But many of the human diseases in particular are linked back to mammals, but not all of those, of course. Avian diversity um, also plays a role there. And similarly, and uh, Christina showed this map, this is the, the original from what was used in that state of knowledge report. What we see is these drivers really link back to what we are doing as people on this planet. So land use change, agricultural industry change, travel and commerce, they're all linked to these EID events objectively. Once again, this is not anybody's personal opinion. It's real objective data. And so I would question the fact that we call some of these natural disasters. I'm not sure that's actually the right term. I think they're un unnatural. Uh, it has a lot to do with what we're doing on this planet. Um, and disease emergence, these outbreaks, just fall clearly in that category of disaster risk reduction and under should fit nicely under that framework because they're increasing and they're being driven by what we are doing. So whether you want to call them natural disasters or unnatural disasters, I don't really care, but we do need to do some things to start preventing them because we have the information on where they're most likely to occur and we have the information on what kind of activities we're doing that lead to their occurrence. So we have two big opportunities to actually move into the prevention and risk reduction framework strategies at country levels because we know where and we know why. Now at country levels, of course, we can break these up. And Chadia, Dr. Wadnall showed this earlier because there's not a one global solution, which is fine. What we really need to be doing is working at country levels and tackle the the drivers of disease emergence for, that are appropriate at the country and allow countries and help them develop strategies to reduce some of that risk. We'll never eliminate all the risk, but we can reduce the risk. We don't have to wait for an outbreak like Ebola. This is what we typically think of. This is disaster response. It's a very sad story if that's what we have to do. If we're always waiting for a disaster and then just responding better, that's not really helping us in the long term. What we really need to do is, that was a case of Ebola, we know what drives Ebola outbreaks and that's contact with the reservoir, which is wildlife, and it links to biodiversity and biodiversity loss. So this is a logging camp, this is a logging operation in the Congo, and you can see that it's plopped down in the middle of the just remote forest 
a whole community comes in and is developed there. They start, they don't have readily available supplies of safe food or water, so they're drinking local water, they're going out and capturing wildlife. The amounts of wildlife that's consumed is tremendous. Uh, the best estimates are about a billion kilograms a year of bushmeat just in Central Africa alone. That's wild meat. So we shouldn't be surprised if we get a case of Marburg or a case of Ebola. If you've been watching the news, there's just been some cases of Marburg hemorrhagic fever virus detected in Uganda. So we know what drives these things and we know where we need to focus our attention. It's ripe for us to start doing risk reduction and coming up with strategies. So what we, the theory and the concept, but we can actually put it in practice, if you look at this graph, we can move to the left. So um, in the epidemiology world, we say the left of the epi curve, because we want to reduce the cases before that peak in the middle, instead of coming in at the end and doing confirmation. If you come from the security world, if you're worried about bombs and terrorists, they call left of boom, and I kind of like that so, uh, that terminology. So uh, it's a little scientific to go left of the epi, move left on the epi curve. I think left of boom is something everybody can understand, and I think that's where we are all come together and working, uh, dis regardless of the source or the type of disaster we're talking about. We really have to move towards risk reduction, and that's about prevention and avoiding the things that lead to that. These, um, if you don't live in a country that seems to be a high-risk country, um, you're not safe either because diseases don't have to just arise. They can arrive. And so we can map out where airports and air travel and transport. And as you remember, that third driver of pandemics and disease emergence and spreading is global travel and trade. So we actually also can uh, predict, tell you where geographically where these diseases are more likely to arrive. Once again, an opportunity for prevention because we can put in place better practices at these locations for screening, for better control, maybe pre-screening before um, diseases arrive, better surveillance techniques. And of course, this link, of course, to the weather, whether or not you want to call it climate, uh, climate change, I know in the U.S. we don't have any problems with climate change, but some of your countries do. Here in the U.S. we call it really bad weather. Um, so what, whatever you call it, it doesn't matter because what happens is it's another one of these drivers, especially for vector-borne diseases, but actually for food security too. So once again, this is a more temporal prediction because the weather and the climate is changing, so that geographically these are moving, but they're still also predictable and allow us to move ahead of time and do risk reduction. And so with that, I'll finish up. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Karish, for that really wonderful overview of how we can actually drill down to risk reduction. Um, our last speaker is Dr. Timothy Boulay, who serves as climate and health specialist at the World Bank. Timmy, over to you. Okay, thank you. All right, so sorry about that. Complete, complete disaster. Okay, um, so anyway, I will just proceed like that didn't happen uh, and thank uh, Dr. Karish for all of his great jokes in that last presentation, which were excellent. So thank you for that. Um, and we'll just quickly get moving along. Uh, so we've heard a tremendous amount uh, about One Health and disaster threats and about some opportunities. And that's really what I want to focus on in this presentation. Um, because I think that, that it's opportunities that, that get us closer to solutions. So for, forgive me if uh, some of you know this already, I'm just going to quickly spend a moment on the World Bank um, because I know there's probably a diversity of expertise on, on this webinar. So our scope includes nearly 190 countries, both donors and, and clients, wealthy countries and lower income countries. Our investment portfolio is more than $60 billion a year across more than a dozen sectors uh, and individual investments can reach several hundred million dollars uh, and span multiple countries. And so it's really important for us to balance the diverse needs and interests of many actors, both when implementing individual investments or developing a new knowledge area like One Health or uh, in disaster preparedness and response. So quickly, what is the World Bank? We were initiated after World War II. Um, this stuff's probably not that interesting, but we have twin goals of alleviating extreme poverty and increasing shared prosperity. And that's important because uh, you know, just in the sense that we work in economic metrics, but we're also fundamentally about people and development. Why are we thinking about One Health? Well, you know, first it aligns with international agendas. It underpins the sustainable development goals. 
the universal UN-led call to action to protect people and, and the planet. Of the 17 goals, um, these six are directly aligned with the, the science and the practice of One Health. Um, they have to do with the, the biophysical processes and achieving success in any of these really requires coordination with the others. One Health provides the framework for understanding and implementing to, to make this happen, I think. But, but um, success in the other 11 is also contingent upon these because these are the ones that are dependent upon socially mediated institutions. Um, and in order to, to achieve these, you really also need to have successful and healthy people and the environment. Um, so, so why else One Health? So a One Health approach is also incredibly important in the, in the regions and the countries in which we work. Uh, Dr. Kara showed a, a variation of this slide before. Uh, which illustrates where emerging infectious disease events are caused by zoonotic pathogens from, from wildlife. And then when overlaying with a map of World Bank regions, you know, where we work, you'll see that these regions fit squarely within our investment geographies. Um, so it's not the best graphic, but you, you can sort of see vaguely where that is. Um, One Health is also critically important to our business lines. We're the leading global financer of agriculture, nearly $3 billion in commitments last year. The Environment and Natural Resources Global Practice has a portfolio of about 170 projects worth seven and a half billion. The World Bank Health and Nutrition Portfolio is about 12 billion. And we have this extensive and growing portfolio in climate change mitigation and adaptation across multiple sectors um, with more than $10 billion to 177 projects in, in 2016. So, you know, it really just makes sense to work at the intersection of these, which is really where One Health is. Um, I won't go into these, but these are just some impacts associated with zoonotic disease, One Health impacts, um, and impacts on humans, animals, and the environment. Um, you know, infectious diseases undermine human health, they undermine animal health, and they stand to get considerably worse uh, in the future with climate change. Dr. Perez also showed this slide. Um, you know, if the, the tangible impacts weren't enough, the financial one should really drill this message home. Um, you know, billions and potentially trillions of dollars worth of impacts uh, across multiple sectors. So uh, thank you guys again at EcoHealth for the preparation of this slide, which is a critical illustration um, that's valuable to, to our work at the World Bank, which has got a lot to do with numbers. So, um, oh, and sorry, one more slide. This is a slide lifted from UNS, I, UNISDR, so thank you, Jadir, for this. Again, just sort of illustrating the, the impacts of disasters. And I don't believe this even includes uh, the cost associated with uh, health impact from that previous slide. Um, but this is just about uh, natural or unnatural disasters, as uh, Dr. Karish has said. So again, great incentive for the World Bank to be working at this intersection. So what are some of the available tools that we have uh, to respond to these emergent disasters uh, and, and One Health threats? Um, so this is something that we have here at the World Bank, uh, climate and disaster risk screening tools. And this really comes on the front end of disaster preparedness. It's helping us to avoid disaster risk. So we need to screen all World Bank in, uh, investments moving forward for uh, potential disaster risk to make sure that they uh, are, are reducing the potential impact on, on people and then also negative project outcomes. Um, on the back end, we have this, the World Bank Recovery Hub to help people recover from natural disasters. So again, as Dr. Karish said, this is not really the position that you want to be in, um, but the unfortunate reality is that we are often finding ourselves in this position. And so we need to have a response mechanism so we can uh, recover from, from disasters. Uh, we also have this, uh, just a bit of guidance, just an illustration of how disasters and the health sector are connected to the World Bank. And this is just a, a checklist uh, for the health sector, things to do um, to make sure that all the bases are covered when, when responding to um, whatever natural disaster uh, might have might have occurred. Um, separately, we have these, these different modes of pandemic finance. So building on the lessons from Ebola, the World Bank, in partnership with the WHO, has developed the Pandemic Emergency Financing Facility. Uh, and this is uh, to enable uh, funding to help prevent the rare high severity disease outbreaks like, like Ebola. Um, and it covers outbreaks of infectious diseases most likely to cause uh, major epidemics like flu, Ebola, Marger, Marburg, Lassa fever, so on. Um, and the, the PEF includes an insurance window of about half a billion dollars for three years with a replenishable cash window of up to 100 million bucks. So it's a, it's a pretty significant feature in the global landscape. 
Um, and then we also have, uh, you know, this, this on the left, uh, it's a report by the International Working Group on Financing Preparedness. Um, and it proposes ways for national governments to develop and, and finance investments uh, for regional preparedness and response programs for pandemics and other health emergencies. And I'll talk about in just a moment what the World Bank is doing in that sphere. Um, moving back to One Health, what are we doing and, and how are we trying to solve some of these problems? So this is more or less the accepted construct for, for One Health. Um, and we're, of course, working within this, but we're not covering everything. We're not doing you know, food systems and, and nutrition um, and, and calling that One Health. I mean, the World Bank is certainly financing those things, but for various structural reasons, we're focusing on infectious disease within our new operational, operational framework. Um, and this is done, again, just so that we can scope this and so we can sort of work rapidly to get these, uh, these different mechanisms funded within the institution. So what, what exactly are we doing? Well, we spent the past six years um, developing this. Um, and, and this is, you know, it's really a uh, longhand for One Health, um, all of these things for, um, sorry, this is the slide that I should be on here. Um, operational framework, oops, did I just lose that? There we go. For strengthening human, animal, and environmental public health systems. Um, what is it and, and what, it, what will it do? Well, first of all, it's an educational document. It's about 200 pages long. It's been socialized and reviewed at the WHO, OIE, FAO, ILRI, UNEP, CBD, and widely within this institution. Um, and so this exercise alone is possibly you know, worth it for the, the awareness building. Um, it also lays out the approach to applying One Health and, and World Bank operations, who is needed in the room, uh, what are the investment options, what are the economic and development benefits, where should we be working, what types of projects are good candidates, so on and so on. Uh, but it's also an incredibly valuable political tool because it enables governments and countries who already have a One Health perspective to approach the institution for funding and support. Um, so importantly, this is, you know, it's not a report, it's, a, it's an operational framework, a blueprint for making investments and working with clients, um, and that's a really important distinction. Um, and, and can't express enough gratitude to our colleagues at Equal Health Alliance who have been absolutely critical in the development of, of this program um, and, and will be as we move forward with the implementation of this work uh, on the ground in many countries. Um, but then also a huge thanks to all of our international partners at CBD and UNISDR and, and UNEP and UNDP and FAO who have been great collaborators uh, in this process and moving it forward. Um, this is a particularly tedious slide, I apologize for that, but um, it, just look at the headings and it'll give you a flavor of some of the resources that are available in this document and some of what's been pulled together to help socialize some of these concepts and provide in-country teams uh, with the tools they need to address human, animal, and environmental health threats um, that, uh, of course, include uh, disaster preparedness and, and response. Um, this is just a conceptual model of, of what this might look like. Again, we don't expect this program to fix all the infectious disease or, or One Health issues in countries. Rather, we hope that it will add another level of protection uh, to work in concert with other global programs. So this is just illustrative, it's not comprehensive, and there are, I'm sure, better examples of, of global programs, but I hope that it provides an overall sense of the idea. Essentially, every global program has, has something to offer, and each works to reduce disease threats specific to its mandate. Um, the One Health framework that, that we've established, the, the last little bit there, the, the rose-colored lens, um, does this as well, but by recommending interventions and providing tools to help further diminish these risks that these other programs are already addressing. Um, and now quickly moving to sort of some One Health and, and development action. Um, there's, uh, there's this, the Regional Disease Surveillance Systems Enhancement Project, RDSA, which is a, a new project that aims to strengthen disease surveillance in ECOWAS countries, the economic community of West African states. And this project was launched in 2016 after the Ebola outbreak, uh, building on the momentum associated with uh, the response and recovery efforts um, after the outbreak. And the idea here is, is just to establish core country and, and regional capacities to build resilient, broad-based disease surveillance and, and response systems. Um, and again, the idea is to, to increase inter-country collaboration uh, and collective action, again, in partnership with organizations like Gates, WHO, CDC, OIE, and, and others, um, and, and again, Equal Health Alliance. And I can tell you that it's been a real One Health effort. 
uh, involving specialists from across the spectrum, ecology, public health, infectious diseases, disaster climate, you know, really working together to shape this lending package of several hundred million dollars and ensure that the interventions include things like expanded access to training, laboratories for rapid diagnoses, cross-border containment, early warning systems, and so on. Uh, and so over the, the next several years, th this project should disperse funds to help achieve these outcomes. Um, and again, this is something that's been built in response to the, the Ebola disaster. Um, next, here's a, just a slide of Antananarivo, Madagascar. It was here just a couple of weeks ago where we were conducting an environmental health analysis um, and related to sort of threats and opportunities in country and then linking that to World Bank group investment. Um, we wanted to, to fundamentally determine the underlying drivers of disease and make recommendations for interventions to address them. Um, and so this was just a process, I'm sorry this is the slides in French, but a stepwise process uh, employing a One Health approach where we did research, we met with folks in country uh, from the Environment Ministry, the Health Ministry, Disaster Ministry, uh, got the, the best feedback that we could and have made uh, interventions, uh, recommendations for interventions that go into World Bank investments to assure that they they address these shared disease threats. Um, and then this is just a, sort of a, an illustration of the, the different sectors that involved that are involved in this. They really go beyond a traditional One Health approach and dig deeply into the the World Bank investment portfolio. Um, but then we were there, of course. This happened, and this was an an outbreak of, of the plague. Um, you know, current numbers, something like 800 people have been affected, you know, at several dozen deaths. Um, and, and of course, this has uh, incredible sort of association with environmental determinants. Um, again, highlighting the absolute need for some kind of One Health approach in this country to prevent, prepare for, and now respond uh, to this environmental health disaster uh, that is, is unfolding as we speak. So. That's all I got. Sorry for the mayhem at the beginning, and I hope that wasn't too hectic going through. Hello? Am I still there? You guys still there? <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Boulay. It's, it's wonderful to hear about the really impressive work that you and your colleagues are doing at the World Bank, and we appreciate how much you're embedding One Health in, in really prevention through recovery of health and other disasters. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much to all of our presenters for your really inspiring uh, coverage of this topic and giving us some really tangible resources and actions that can be taken to focus. Um, I'm aware that several of the presenters have to sign off, unfortunately, but I think a few can remain on. And if there are any questions, we, we just ask that you type them in the chat box here. Um, and we'll give uh, one or two minutes for people to type in any questions in the chat box, and if not, we have some questions that uh, can further elaborate on this topic. And Dr. Romanelli, if you're still on the line, I just had a question for you that came in from one of our colleagues in the room. Um, in, in terms of the National Biodiversity Strategies and Action Plans, uh, do you foresee some areas where countries are already taking actions to embed One Health uh, in pursuit of disaster risk reduction or some areas that uh, could be taken forward through these you know, really ex excellent existing plans or, or ones that are developed in the future? Yes, so thank you for the uh, thank you for the question um, uh, to to from from colleagues actually that's a very important um, that's a very important question. I think that there are uh, numerous ar opportunities arising for embedding one health um, maybe not not only specifically to uh, d disaster risk reduction plans but certainly in national biodiversity strategies and action plans. Uh, at large, so we are, as as uh, as some of you may know, uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity has actually welcomed uh, One Health as um, as a holistic approach in two of its decisions, both in 2014 and more recently at the 13th Conference of the Parties in uh, 2016, which means that it. It's 197 countries unanimously agreed that there is value in adopting uh, the One Health approach. Now, there is still some way to 
go between recognizing the, the potential value of One Health approaches and then actually embedding them and implementing them in um, national biodiversity strategies and action plans. That being said, there is <clears throat> Um, we are currently working uh, with under the CBD and uh, WHO joint work program on biodiversity and health and with other partners um, to develop a guidance on One Health which will serve to inform uh, member states on how to effectively integrate biodiversity considerations into One Health approaches. And of course, ecosystem-based adaptation and mitigation measures are a critically important way to, um, to achieve this goal. So yes, there are opportunities that are forthcoming. Um, we, we are also planning a dialogue across the WHO European region. Um, in Helsinki just next month, or sorry, just next week rather, <laughs> um, which covers uh, the 53 countries in the WHO European region in which One Health approaches uh, will be discussed. And um, Dr. Wanous, who is also um, attending that conference, may further elaborate on opportunities that will be discussed and presented to uh, to policymakers in that venue and in that context, and uh, that will serve to inform the development of national biodiversity strategies and action plans, of course, but also potentially national adaptation strategies or uh, national health strategies. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Romanelli. That's that's really encouraging. And I don't know, Dr. Manaus, do you do you want to respond and add anything? Uh, thank you, Christina. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, I just want uh, the, uh, to add that uh, this effort, uh, um, in support of the countries, uh, it has to be coherent because we are asking countries to do uh, multiple national plans on, on multiple issues but actually those issues are interlinked. So uh, what we are uh, working now with the uh, biodiversity and WHO and the colleagues is uh, to advocate for uh, one uh, national action plan uh, for all those uh, uh, areas, uh, disaster risk reduction, climate adaptation, biodiversity, uh, and also uh, through the One Health approach. Okay. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Renaus. It's great to hear. And thank you so much to all our wonderful presenters and participants for joining us today to discuss this important topic. We encourage you to disseminate this information and keep learning about this, as well as consult the resources our colleagues have highlighted from their work. This webinar has been recorded, so we'll be posting a link of the recording, as well as a summary of the topics covered today. Um, please check the Future Earth Open Network under the Health Knowledge Action Network page. Again, thank you to our presenters and our participants. It's been great. Thank you so much for everybody. Thank you. Thank you to everyone.